In an old cemetery, wood crosses stand like sentries, keeping watch over a time long past. One can almost hear voices. They speak the words of native peoples and the language of the empire that built an extraordinary outpost on this piece of Northern California coastline, Russian. Perched on a flat bluff overlooking a sheltered Pacific cove is Fort Ross, now a California State Historic Park. From 1812 through 1841, Fort Ross was Russia's southernmost settlement in America. Founded as a base for hunting fur seal and sea otter, it also grew food for Russian colonies in Alaska. It evolved into a center for farming, ranching, timber harvests, and shipbuilding. This remarkable crossroads of time, place, and cultures had a profound influence upon California and an impact that endures 200 years after the Russians departed. For centuries before, the Kashaya Pomo inhabited the forested ridges and coastal terraces of this area. During the winter, the Kashaya settled in the hills, subsisting on acorns, plants, and game. Summers were spent by the shore in an area they called Mitini, where they harvested shellfish, kelp, fish, and sea salt. The Kashaya also crafted fine finished baskets from woolly sedge grass, colored with black walnut and red bud. Well adapted to an environment that met their basic needs, the vibrant Kashaya culture had not yet been influenced like so many tribes in other parts of the Americas. But powerful forces of change were brewing on the other side of the world during the 16th through 18th centuries, as restless European empires sent forth explorers to find trade routes, goods of value, and land to claim. Russian explorers pushed east into Siberia, across the Bering Sea to the Aleutian Islands, Kodiak Island, and finally Sitka. They were seeking the warm and waterproof pelts of fur so highly valued from China to Europe. The growth of this trade led to permanent posts in the Aleutians, where Russians enlisted skilled native Alaskan hunters in their swift and agile kayaks called baidarkas. But growing food in the harsh Arctic climate was difficult, and shipping supplies from European Russia proved costly and unreliable. The Russian-American company's outposts were plagued by malnutrition and disease. In response, Russian-American manager-in-chief Alexander Baranov ordered his top assistant, Ivan Kuskov, to lead an expedition to California to search for a settlement from which to supply Alaska. He established a base at Bodega Bay, some 60 miles north of the Spanish Presidio of San Francisco, where he made contact with the Coast Miwok people. Nearby, he found plentiful fresh water, timber, pasture, and farmland. In 1812, Kuskov moved his base further up the coast to a site not easily accessible or vulnerable to attack by the Spanish, nor was it near British claims further north. He was accompanied by 25 Russians, mostly craftsmen, and 80 Alaskan natives who brought along 40 Baidarkas for hunting. In the oral tradition of the Kashaya, the arrival is still accounted for two centuries later through the story passed down by Lucaria Ipau Myers. Using the plentiful redwood trees, the craftsmen set about building a traditional Russian stockade, 
with log buildings similar to those found in Siberia and on Alaska's Sitka Island. Two blockhouses were constructed, each two stories high and with ports for cannons, flying the flag of the Russian American Company. The new colony was named Settlement Ross, a poetic nod to Imperial Russia. By 1817, the interior of the stockade included warehouses, barracks, and a well-furnished residence for Kuskov, with the first glass windows in California. Eight years later, the Russian Orthodox Chapel was built, and occasional services were conducted by visiting priests. Outside the stockade walls, the workers built California's first windmill, a threshing floor, dairy barn, a bakery, 24 houses, and nine bathhouses. After some time, the local chiefs agreed to the settlement and were given gifts and medals of friendship. The Kashaya appreciated that the Russians showed little interest in forced religious conversions. Many Indians were hired to work in the fields and were paid in flour, meat, clothing, and beads. Although relations between the Russians and Kashaya were largely free of the conflict found in so many other New World encounters, not all of the natives were pleased with the settlement. Russian officials lived inside the stockade, a sanctuary into which the Kashaya were seldom allowed. But outside, communities quickly sprouted. At one edge of the stockade, native Alaskans set up a village on the bluff above the sea. At another, lower-ranking Russian employees and their native spouses established quarters for growing families. The offspring of these unions were called Creoles, and they were an important part of the multicultural community. By 1820, the local sea otter population was severely depleted by overhunting. The Russian-American company introduced a moratorium on taking otters, one of the earliest examples of marine mammal conservation in the Pacific. Settlers, in turn, focused attention on agriculture and ranching. Experiments with fruit trees, including peach, apple, cherry, and pears, led to a productive orchard with about 260 trees. But the original concept of producing wheat and other crops for the Alaskan colonies failed due to infertile soils, pests, and the marine climate. The settlers had greater success raising livestock that provided salted beef, butter, and wool for Alaska. Daily life at Fort Ross was routine and yet busy as hunting parties went after fish and game, while others cut and hauled timber back to the settlement. At sheds near the cove, artisans made furniture, barrels, plows, and other hardware, while blacksmiths hammered metal into useful items. The workmen fashioned redwood beams for construction, sections of prefabricated dwellings, and even seagoing ships, the first built in California. Fort Ross produced goods valued throughout the region, California's Spanish and Mexicans were in great need of the plows, axes, nails, wheels, and cookware, which representatives from the Russian-American company exchanged for grain, salt, and agricultural goods. Ships from a number of nations visited the colony's protected harbor at Bodega Bay, which was named Port Rumiantsev. Others stopped at Ross to trade, and were customarily signaled by cannons, the only time the weapons were ever used. The Russian Academy of Sciences also sponsored many expeditions to California by scientists and artists. Their studies remained the most thorough account of Alta California, its wildlife and native people from that time. One of these scientists, Ilya Voznesensky, stayed at Fort Ross and conducted the most comprehensive studies of the surrounding area. The fifth and final manager of Fort Ross, Alexander Rochev, arrived in the late 1830s. A prominent writer and translator conversant in several languages, Rochev was eventually joined by his elegant wife, 
Yelena, the former Princess Gagarina, and their three children. Under Rochev's command, the company built the manager a new house that bears his name, and which was said to possess a choice library, a piano, and a score of Mozart. French sea captain Cyril Laplace was clearly enthralled. The mistress of the house, a young and gracious lady with a good figure and distinguished manners, speaking fluent French, gave us the nicest and most eager welcome. Soon, pressure mounted against Fort Ross. Independent Mexico and the United States encouraged settlers to move into the area, a potential challenge to Russian claims. And in 1839, declining fortunes prompted the Russian-American company to sign a contract with the Hudson Bay Company to take over supplying the Alaskan colonies. Although Fort Ross was no longer needed, Alexander Rochev personally opposed the sale of a most beloved place and assignment. What an enchanting land California is. I spent the best years of my life there and affectionately carry the memories of these days in my soul. Rochev nonetheless carried out his orders to sell the movable assets and found a buyer in Captain John Sutter who moved several buildings and the livestock to his ranch in the Sacramento Valley. On January 1st, 1842, Rochev and about a hundred colonists sailed from Bodega Bay on a ship bound for New Archangel, or Sitka, marking the end of the formal Russian presence on the California coast. So began the Fort Ross Ranch period when William Bennett's arrived to manage the fort on Sutter's behalf and soon after acquired the surrounding land Bennett's restored the fort's warehouse and constructed a stone wharf in the cove below the fort. In 1873, American adventurer George W. Call purchased Fort Ross and much of the ranch land. Call built barns, wagon sheds, and a smithy and transformed the property into a bustling business, shipping, and communications center. He and his young Chilean wife, Mercedes, raised nine children on what came to be known as the Call Ranch. Eventually outgrowing the Rochev house, they built a residence outside the stockade, which stands to this day. Daughter Laura Call Carr expressed the joy of growing up along the coast. We lived in a world of our own creating, of natural history and games which we ourselves invented. On Sunday mornings, we went to the wonderful sandy beach where we learned about the small creatures that dwelled there. Timber harvested in nearby forests was shipped from the call landing as fence posts, railroad ties, and cordwood, while the ranch produced and sold apples, butter, and calves. Meanwhile, Fort Ross and its shoreline and forests became a destination for tourists, mostly from San Francisco. With the calls in their new home, the Rochev house was leased out as a hotel, while old buildings were put to new uses. The officials' quarters were converted into the Fort Ross Saloon and Laundry. The old warehouse became a dance hall. The chapel was used for weddings, and also to store apples and stable horses. With both a post office and telegraph station, Fort Ross became the northern coast's social center. In 1903, George Call sold the stockade area to the California Historical Landmarks League. Most of the buildings showed the ravages of time and weather. And finally, the great 1906 earthquake on the nearby San Andreas Fault caved in the chapel's walls. A painstaking process of reconstruction began. The chapel has since been rebuilt several times and the Rochev House refurbished. Today's park attracts some one million visitors annually, including more than 6,000 school children on field trips. Some participate in the environmental living program and spend a night experiencing life as the young people of Fort Ross did some two centuries ago. 
The touchstones of the period are tangible, and the artifacts of daily life, and at the graves in the cemetery. The orchard still produces fruit from gnarled trees, some from seeds of trees planted nearly 200 years ago. Place names, such as the Russian River and Russian Gulch, are constant reminders of the old colony. During celebrations at Fort Ross, the cannons are still fired. Perhaps the most special event is held annually on the last Saturday of every July. On Cultural Heritage Day, thousands of visitors attend, many wearing historical dress, and reenact tasks and scenes that might well have taken place at the colony. In the cove, Vaidarkas glide once again. People from the Kashaya tribe join the occasion and share their knowledge and traditions. An orthodox ceremony is held in the church, drawing attendees from California and beyond. As all honor the memory of their forebears, the voices bring Old Fort Ross back to life.